This is an interview with Mr. Lewis Manderson, born 1016, 1925. Interviewer is taking place at the Atlanta History Center. Also in attendance is Mr. Lee Davis, Ms. Sean Griffin, Mr. Adrian Carter. The interviewer is Robert Gardner. Mr. Manderson, can you tell me what war and branch of service you served in, sir? The Air Force. World War II. Were you drafted or did you enlist, sir? I enlisted. <clears throat> Where were you living at the time? Cordova, Alabama. Why did you join? Everybody was, uh, it was, uh, it was, uh, I graduated from high school in 1943 and everybody was, uh, knew that they were going into service at that time, so it was a matter of determining which you wanted to do and, uh, like, uh, fly an airplane was a glamorous thing to do back then, and so uh, I, like a lot of other guys, uh, I wanted to fly an airplane, so I felt the Air Corps was what I needed to do. Do you recall your first days in service, sir? My first days, yes. What was it like, please? Well, it was a very regimented life, and uh, my uh, start because they sent me to Miami Beach to do, uh, do my uh, basic training and you stayed in those uh, luxury hotels that uh, were, uh, that had been built during that era and so our quarters were pretty flush and uh, that was a great surprise to me and, uh, and then just the regiment of marching and all the things that you do uh, was a great surprise. Can you tell me about any of your other boot camp or training experiences, sir? Well, we, from, uh, from, from basic training, I went to Fort Myers, Florida to uh, gunnery school. Uh, I had intended, I uh, passed the exam to go into pilot training before I, uh, uh, when I went into service. And it became pretty obvious that I was um, among a bunch of uh, college graduates and I was uh, from a good country high school and it was obvious that I didn't have the educational background to do that and then they pointed that out pretty vividly for me and so they sent me to gunnery school and the, the one thing I remember about gunnery school more than anything else is that we lived in tents uh, when I first got there until the barracks could, uh, would become available and uh, the mosquitoes were absolutely horrible. They were like the size of flies or wasps or something. I mean, those things were the biggest things I had ever seen in my life. And of course, I never lived in sand, and there was sand in my bed every single night. And uh, those are the two things about uh, gunnery school that, that uh, stand out in my mind. Do you remember any of your instructors, sir? No. How did you get through the basic training? Get through it? Well, it was, uh, it really wasn't hard to get through. It was, uh, I enjoyed it. It was, uh, it was a great experience. And a lot of young guys uh, just like me. And uh, a lot of camaraderie. And after the, uh, after the restrictions, you know, you have to go through several weeks before you can even do anything. But once that's done, I mean, it was a lot of fun to be in uh, Miami, Florida, and, uh, and all those guys, uh, uh, nice guys to be around. It was a lot of fun. So I got through it easily. Which war did you serve in, sir? World War II. Where exactly did you go? Well, in, in, my, in my service career, I went from, to, as I told you, to gunnery school, and then they sent me to March Field in uh, California, which is just south of Los Angeles, actually in Riverside. And so we got crew training there. Then they sent me to Hamilton Air Force Base in San Francisco, where they just processed you. Then I took a troop train all the way to, uh, to uh, all the way across the United States to um, Boston. And that was quite an experience. That troop train all the way across the United States. That was a 
drudgery in a way, but a, a very enjoyable thing in a way. You know, when we stopped at golf, the train people were there and they met us and they gave us uh, goodies and they loved us and hugged our necks and all that stuff. And it was it was a it was a great experience. Was there anything unusual that happened while you were on the troop train? No, just that, just that. The uh, hospitality that we met all along the way. Some of our guys got off the troop train and, and uh, they missed the train. And some of the uh, civilians uh, picked them up and drove them to the next town. And, you know, it was, it was just, a, uh, just a, a great experience to have that, you know, uh, to see how, you, how the world viewed our troops at that time. And it was wonderful. They loved us. What was your first duty station where you were assigned to fly, sir? Well, we were flying all, all the way through. We, from the beginning, after basic training, gunnery school, we were, were training uh, as gunners. <coughs> and so we were flying then. And then we, when I went to March Field, we were flying there as a crew. And then we, the crew was, was uh, then shipped to, uh, up to uh, England, where we were assigned to a base in, in the uh, 8th Air Force. Do you remember arriving there and what it was like, sir? Yes, yes. Uh, the whole tr uh, troop, uh, I went across on a troop ship and it took seven days, I believe it was. And uh, there, there was, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, thing of danger was there. You, you, were, you were briefed uh, on the dangerous aspect of it, and so we thought of that. And, uh, and then, uh, then outside of that, the troop, uh, the troop uh, trip was uh, the troop ship was another experience that I've never done. I've never been on a ship in my life. I'd hardly been on anything bigger than a skiff, and so you know I had the same thing. I got seasick, and so that lasted a day or so. And then I learned how to shoot craps, and uh, that uh, was a was a great experience. And uh, they learned how to take my money very well. <laughs> and, uh, so, and then arriving in England, and here I am in a foreign country, a, a boy from Walker County, Alabama. I mean, you know, man, it was, it was glamorous. It was, it was wonderful. What was your exact job or assignment uh, on the aircraft, sir? I was a tail gunner on a B-24. Did you see combat? Yes. Were there many casualties in your unit, sir? No. Uh, we were actually, we were there at the end, at the end of the war. We were there, I, in fact, I was in Europe when the war ended. I had flown 18 combat missions at that time. So there wasn't nearly the uh, casualties that there were for those that preceded me. They're the guys that really took the beating. Uh, we were, we uh, had uh, casualties, uh, maybe one of the biggest hazards we had was, was the weather. Uh, getting formed into formation in those uh, clouds was always, it was always a horrific thing to, to do. And that was, that was a great hazard. And, uh, and we had any aircraft fire. Uh, just seeing those puffs and hear, hear the flak hitting your airplane uh, was a scary thing. And, uh, but so far as casual as it are concerned. There were casualties, but uh, there were nothing like the casualties that were uh, those that preceded me. Can you tell me about a couple of your most memorable experiences, sir? Uh, yeah. Um, I guess the most memorable experience was uh, on my second mission. Uh, we were we were the weather was horrible, and we were we were forming. Sometimes uh, when the weather was bad, they would send you to the continent where the weather was, if the weather was better there, so that you would actually fly singularly until you got there and then get in formation. And uh, this particular morning, we were, we were getting in the formation, and uh, uh, I, as I said, I was in, the, in the, the tail position of the airplane, and a plane pulled up very close to us, and, and uh, so I called the pilot and I said, there's a, there's a guy back here so close I can see the color of their eyes. 
And uh, he said, well, uh, and he called me Mandy. And they said, well, Mandy, uh, I said, you keep your eye on him and tell us what he's doing. And so the plane pulled on under us. And he was, uh, the pilot didn't really understand how close I was telling him this plane was. It was right on us. And so in just maybe a minute or two minutes, the uh, nose gunner uh, looked around from the front of the plane. And he just screamed over the inter inter intercom, and he said, George, this, this plane is so close, our propellers are running together. And so with that, the, the, the pilot sensed that the urgency of what would happen, and he pulled our plane up. Apparently, the plane that, uh, that was so close uh, didn't have anybody in their, in their top turret. We, all, everybody was expected to watch out for other planes at all times. That was a major, major assignment. And the guy that was, that was in the top turret was responsible for uh, being sure that you could come upon somebody from the bottom side. Well, they apparently didn't have anybody in their top turret in that plane. We pulled up, they pulled out, and from my tail position, uh, the, uh, I just saw parts of air, felt the bump, bam, we hit. And, uh, and then I saw pieces of airplane just flying by me back there. And I didn't know whether it was our plane or their plane or what it was. I mean, you know, I was scared to death. And so I was so scared. I, I was 6'2", uh, and crammed in that little tail turret back there. And I was so afraid that I was the first one that got to the escape hatch. I got out of that tail, that curve looked on my parachute and got it open the patch before anybody else could get up. And I don't say that as a feat. I said I was so scared that I was absolutely acting on instinct. And, uh, that was the most uh, uh, terrifying and the most uh, thing that stands out in my mind uh, more than anything else. The uh, combat was uh, scary. Black was scary, and uh, you know there was there were stories that were told about when you would go over certain targets. They knew beforehand that it was going to be very very, very uh, intense at uh, any aircraft fire, and they would tell you that it was you know, look out those puffs and they're bursting all around you. It was, it was uh, scary. Uh, that was. Uh, probably the two most scary incidents. We were hit by fighters one time. We were, 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 were fired upon by fighters one time. Uh, and it was the first time I had ever seen a jet fighter. And that jet pulled right up behind and, and, uh, and I fired at him. And uh, I thought I got him. But the truth was that I found out uh, when we got down and talked with folks on the ground that knew about such things that the jet would fly up, and then they could just they could just lose just straight down like that, and I didn't know that, and uh, so I thought I'd hit him, and uh, but the truth of the matter is that he had just, he just darted down, to, he he was through with us, and just wanted to go do something else, and so actually I didn't uh, I didn't hit him at all. Uh, I guess the the uh, one of the humorous things that happened uh, on. Uh, during that time was the, we used to, uh, uh, when we would get airborne and get in formation, then the pilot, maybe before we got in formation, the pilot would say, okay, you can, you can, uh, you can try your guns now. And so we would, we would put a round in our, in our gun and, and fire it a few rounds to be sure that it's working so that uh, when we got to the, uh, on an enemy territory that we, it would be working at that time. Well, it was cumbersome to do that, uh, particularly for me back in that little turret. I was about like this, and so uh, I got the bright idea. Why in the world don't I just do this on the ground, man? It'd be a lot simpler to just do this on the ground, and then I wouldn't be up there in that cold. It's so cold that your fingers would hardly work. And uh, so I, I said, hey, I'll just do this on the ground. And so uh, we got in uh, this particular mission. We got in our plane, and so. I put the ammunition in, and so I, I, I was going to fire off a couple of rounds. And uh, so I put the ammunition.
ammunition in, and as fate would have it, uh, the gun ran away. That means that you put it, you go to fire a round, and it fires a bunch of rounds. Like, wow, man, it's so quick that you don't know what's happened. Uh, well, that happened, and uh, so the, it, there was a, a lot of lot of uh, shooting going on, and, and finally I got the thing stopped. And man, no sooner than I got it stopped, and sirens were going, and people were running up to the airplane. And, oh my God, you know, and so uh, you know they came. Why? What in the world happened? And so. I didn't know that, that, that uh, I was firing right into an ammunition dump. And they were, you know, everybody was going wild about that. Well, anyway, nothing exploded. And they didn't put me in jail or anything. Uh, so that was another, uh, that was more humorous uh, incident. Uh, the guys used to kid me another thing we, when we got hit by uh, any air, aircraft or uh, shrapnel from any aircraft. Of firing a uh, time or two, they, they kind of riddled the plane sort of back where I was sitting. And so they used to have flak suits that they would, uh, when you started on a mission, they would issue you and you take the flak suit and put it in the plane so that when you got into fire, you could put that flak suit on. The flak suit is sort of like the uh, officers wear, now police officers wear, so that a bullet won't get to them. It'll, it might bruise you, but it won't, won't kill you. And so, uh, you know, I got the smart idea that I'd just get me several of those flak suits. And so I just lined the tail end of the airplane with flak suits. And the guys always said that our plane would fly like this rather than like this because I had to wait it. I had it weighted down with flak suits back there to, to save my skin. <laughs> so I, that was a couple of things that happened. But, but another interesting thing that I told Lee that, that uh, you probably enjoy, and, and so I'll tell you also, the, uh, well, after that second mission, uh, up until that time I had been absolutely uh, unafraid of flying. It just didn't bother me. Man, I'd get on an airplane and go to sleep. Uh, from the training, I'd just go on out to the airplane before it took off, and I'd get in a good, comfortable place where it was warm, and uh, I'd stay right there until the plane took off. And, and, you know, we'd be in the air and they'd wake me up and say, hey, Mandy, come on and do whatever you're supposed to do. So, uh, after that second mission, it absolutely got my attention and, and uh, it scared me bad and it scared all of us. And so, uh, I decided, uh, as I uh, related this story to Lee, I was from a rural town in Alabama, you know, a lot of hell fire the Rumstone Baptist. If you don't do you know, certain things, I mean, you go into hell damnation. <coughs> uh, you know, the, the, uh, a lot of those uh, people, uh, uneducated people, just as I was, uh, you know, the, the deal was, you know, if you wore lipstick, you went to movies, if you danced, all that stuff, you know. You, and so I got to thinking about all that, and after my second mission, I said, you know, I may not get, I may not get back out of this thing, and, and uh, I've never been baptized. And so I went to uh, I went to the, to the chaplain on the base and uh, said I want to be baptized. And so I guess he thought I, I knew what I was talking about, and so he didn't he didn't he didn't question me about it, nor instruct me about it, nor give me some advice on it. He just said, "Okay, well we'll we'll set a time. You want to be baptized?" And I was good. So. The day came and, and I went over to his office and it was the coldest day. It was in the dead of winter in England and it could be the coldest there of any place on earth, I think. So the day came to be baptized and I went over to the chaplain's office and we got his chief. And I had worn just uh, some light clothes because I knew I was going to get in the water and I was going to be ducked. And so uh, I wore some light clothes and we're wearing this chief and it is so cold, man. It is. The jeeps open, so we go out on the, this into to the to the into the woods and could get on a little trail and go all the way back and we get to a little stream and it's he told me that it was a tributary of the uh, River Thames. So we got out of that got out of that jeep and, and uh, he did his little ritual and said a little prayer whatever he did and so then we went into the water and it. 
<laughs> it was so cold, man. I mean, it was so cold. You could, I mean, I couldn't, hard, I couldn't breathe hardly any. So, anyway, uh, we we get in. You know, <laughs> so then he ducks me down in the water, and uh, you know, I just say, God, if you would just get me out of this water, uh, that's really all you have to do for me. <laughs> It was so cold, and so anyway, we got up, got back, and got uh, got the. Uh, we changed clothes, and I had some heavier clothes to put on, and and it was warmer going back, and so uh, all turned out well. Uh, that was one of the little things that I did. Was another one of my exciting things that I did in while I was service. During the time that on your second mission, when the aircraft. Yours. Did you have to bail out or not? No, we did not bail out. We, I was absolutely prepared to bail out. I had on my chute and I opened the, the uh, escape hatch and uh, I was just waiting for the word and I, I would have been out that hatch. But uh, the, the, our pilot didn't understand that we had been, uh, that, that, that it was severe. And he said, he said, did the plane go down? And uh, we watched the plane after it hit. I got out of the turret and we, and we watched the plane. And, and it, it tore their whole, the rear section off of their plane. And uh, so, so uh, and they went into a spin. And, and, and last time we saw them, they were in a cloud. In a cloud and it was an overcast day. And they went through the cloud. Of course, we didn't see them anymore. We crashed and killed them all. But we went on and flew the mission. We uh, had trouble with the plane. Uh, we couldn't keep up. Uh, it had damaged it in some way. I know I don't know what kind of how it damaged it, but uh, we went in. Uh, we w went from one formation to the next with a group of planes, and we couldn't keep up with them. So we had to go to the next formation and the next formation uh, because our plane wouldn't keep up, and, and we did that. But we we went on and completed the mission and. Uh, dropped our bombs and headed back and we had to do the same thing on coming back and because of the damage to our plane the pilot had to give it more power than cruising speed. We couldn't fly at cruising speed because we couldn't keep up. We couldn't keep up anyway but we couldn't keep up at all unless he gave it almost full power and so uh, we were doing the same thing coming back and we were worried about that because we were worried about being a single airplane. Uh, because a single airplane is when it gets picked on. Uh, but at any rate, we, we, we made it back and made it just across the English Channel. And uh, then we and then we had to just land at the first base we could get to because we were low on fuel. And we're worried about getting across the channel. But we did get across the channel and got to a, a, a base, the nearest base, and landed. But no, we did not. They crashed and, and killed all of them. But no, we. Were you awarded any medals or citations, sir? The what? Were you awarded any medals or citations, sir? The only one that I might have qualified for would be the biggest coward over there. <laughs> no, I did not win any. I got, of course, the air medal. I got three air, um, the air medal and two <coughs> Oak Week clusters. But no, no, no particular medals. How did you stay in touch with your family, sir? If, uh, uh, what did they call it back then? Uh, they had a word for the mail that you sent. Email? Email. I guess the email. Email man. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. What was the food like, sir? It was good. It, we ate a lot of spam and uh, uh, we ate a lot of peanut butter and we ate a lot of marmalade. But, uh, you know, it was not. It was, it, you heard all the stories that were so bad, and actually uh, we got tired of it. But, uh, but it, it really wasn't, it wasn't horrible. Did you have plenty of supplies, sir? Did I have what? Did you have plenty of supplies? Oh, yes, oh, yes, lots of supplies. Did you feel pressure or stress? Uh, fear is better word. <laughs> no, no, uh, no. Fear of getting killed is pressure, I guess, but yeah, to that extent.
Was there something special you did for good luck, sir? Was there, was there something special you did for good luck, sir? For good luck? Uh, well, there were certain things you did. I mean, you know, you, you, uh, you wore your dog tags in a certain way, and you, you did everything you did in a certain way if you were superstitious, and I was. Uh, so, yeah, I, I can't think of a thing like I didn't carry a rabbit's foot or anything uh, like that. <coughs> but, uh, uh, I did some of the same things over and over because I, I lived through one mission. I said, I'll do this the same way, so in case if that's the good luck, then it'll, I'll do it again. How did people entertain themselves? Uh, how did we entertain ourselves? Uh, you mean, uh, oh no, well no, uh, you know, if we, if we had leave, then we went into, we were far from London, England, we were in Norwich, and uh, we were far from London, and we, when we had leave, we went to the city, and uh, of course that was uh, a country boy, that was really, really uh, something to do. And uh, so that, now, so far as on, in camp is concerned, we played cards, we shot craps, and we uh, read, and uh, there were movies, and sometimes there was organized uh, entertainment there, and uh, that kind of thing. What type of organized entertainment did they have? Were they like the USO show, sir? Yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah. And they had they have uh, some talent shows there on the base, and the uh, guys that, could, that, that had some talent, musical talent, and then that, that kind of thing would perform for us. You mentioned being on leave. What did you do when you were on leave, sir? <laughs> well, I don't dare tell all, all the, but you know, same tourist and. You know, we visit the pubs and uh, do the tourist attractions, go to movies, go to shows. Did you have an opportunity to, be, to do any other traveling while you were in the service, sir? Not really. Not really. Do you recall any other particularly humorous or unusual events, sir? Read did I tell you any other? Uh, you told the good ones, I know that. I'm trying to think. Um, I, I think I've really covered the, the, the troop train. We, when I was in, I was, when I was stationed at March Field, we went into Los Angeles. And uh, that was, uh, that was exciting. We went to Hollywood and we went to, oh gee, that old club that used to be in, uh, in Hollywood. Uh, <coughs> it was one of the, one of the world famous uh, nightclubs there. And uh, they would let uh, they would let a certain number of servicemen in there. And uh, and so I uh, happened to be one of the lucky ones that went in there with some of my buddies. And uh, gosh, we you know, saw the movie stars out there dancing. I remember particularly Edward G. Robinson Floor dancing this one particular night I was there. And uh, so that was kind of exciting stuff. Uh, but, uh, so much exciting things for me because I was from a small town and I had done those things before. What did you think of your officers or fellow soldiers, sir? They were great. They were absolutely great. Uh, the, uh, our pilot, our, our pilot was a, was a was a man from, uh, a young man from uh, Pennsylvania, and uh, he was just barely older than I. And uh, uh, the uh, bombardier on our plane was a guy who had uh, uh, finished school at Harvard, and uh, they were all just, just really great guys, and the enlisted guys were Call the day your service ended, sir? Uh, yeah. I do. Um, I was discharged. Uh, let's see, I, I had to, I was, I was, uh, I had been in Fort Myers, Florida. Actually, I, when I came home from the service, they were discharging people on the, 
on the uh, on the point system and uh, by the amount of combat you had and, and your training you had and the, the uh, uh, so forth. And uh, I don't recall the, the, the sort of the particular elements, but uh, uh, as a result of that, I had uh, I had enough points to get out, but I didn't have a, enough time in service to get out. And so uh, I had to spend some time in the, in the United States uh, after uh, after I was out of combat. Actually, they had sent us home thinking that we would go to uh, train to, on, to be, be on the B-29 and then uh, to go to, to Japan, go to, to the uh, to Asian theater. And uh, as it uh, turned out, of course, the war in Japan ended also. So I, there I was. I had too, too many... Uh, I had enough points to get out, but I didn't have enough time in service, so I had to stay in for three months. And uh, one of the, the places that I went to was Fort Myers, Florida, again. Uh, one of these things there again, Lord only knows. But anyway, uh, they did. And, uh, and so I went from there to, uh, uh, when I was being separated, they sent me from there to Fort McPherson. And that, from Fort McPherson, I was free. And I remember the day very well. What did you do in the days and weeks afterwards, sir? Well, um, I thought about, uh, you know, a lot about what I was going to do with my life. Uh, the weeks and days, well, I rejoiced for, for several days. But then uh, reality set in and I, I began to try to determine what I was going to do. And uh, I had a couple of good friends that were in service, and uh, they didn't get out until after I did. And so uh, I sort of waited around until they got back. And uh, we, had, we had corresponded and decided that we were going to enroll in college. And uh, so I waited for a few months until they came home and uh, did uh, some odd jobs. Because I wasn't very qualified to do anything really. And uh, then they came home and we uh, enrolled at the University of Alabama and uh, went to school there. Was your education supported by the GI Bill, sir? Yes. <coughs> Did you make any close friendships while in the service? Yes, they were close friendships at that time, but it's uh, like happened so many times when you are separated from people, you know, that you have a lot of good intentions and uh, but they generally don't pan out. We uh, uh, now the nose gunner uh, in our crew was from Pennsylvania and he came down to Alabama and visited uh, with my family, his family with my family uh, after the war. And I went to Pennsylvania and visited uh, with him and then there, there was another real close friend that was in another city in Pennsylvania and I visited with him, his family and my family. That was after I had a family. Uh, the pilot came through. Uh, uh, I, I, I made my home in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. After I went to university there, I stayed in Tuscaloosa and did my, a lot of my career there. I stayed there almost 40 years. And the pilot came through there visiting uh, one time. And then uh, one time I was in uh, Texas. Uh, where was Alamo? Uh, San Antonio. San Antonio. I was in. Yeah, thank you. I was in San San Antonio, and uh, but the pilot stayed in the service uh, after our wartime career. He stayed in the service and retired there. And at that time he was stationed there, so I visited with him. So uh, that, those were the contacts that I had with my uh, crew members after that. Uh, they were great friends. It, it was it, just like you know, after another era of your life. And once it's passed, you, you kind of get out of that mode and go to something else. Did you join a veterans organization, sir? I did not. What did you go on to do as a career after the war? Well, I went to the university, and then I, uh, then I, uh, I, I quit the university. I went about two and a half years to the university, and uh, it was sort of like my, my experience getting in the service. I, my background was so poor, simply because of the, uh, simply because maybe of my intelligence as well.
well as the fact that uh, I went to a small uh, rural high school and it just didn't prepare me much for all the things that I would have to, to face in college. And uh, so I, I went about as far as I could, really, and, uh, rather than flunk out, I quit. And then I went to work for an automobile dealership and worked for them for uh, about six years. And then I went to work for an advertising firm. And I worked for them. Uh, I, I left the automobile dealership because I wanted to, to get a place where I could get some equity in the business. And uh, I, I got an opportunity to do that in the advertising business. I didn't know anything about the advertising business scratch, but uh, I got in the advertising business and uh, I was able to put a company together and buy out my partner and then we began to buy other companies and so I spent uh, about 40 years in the advertising business. Then I uh, came to Atlanta uh, from Alabama and uh, I came to Atlanta because I had an advertising business here. And I uh, sold that company and some other companies I had and started a venture capital company. And I did that for uh, eight years. And then I uh, retired from that. And from that point, I've done nothing but enjoy it. <laughs> did your military experience influence your thinking about war or about the military in general, sir? understanding the horrors of war, uh, but it uh, also influenced me to think uh, I was proud of what we did. And, uh, and, uh, I was proud of our country. And so on. Do you attend any reunions, sir? Or do you attend any reunions, sir? Uh, no, I haven't. Are there any questions that anyone would like to, to ask Mr. Manderson? Mm -hmm. I was curious what the targets of your bombing raids were. Did you have various targets and they changed every time or particular cities and what you could tell us about that? Yes, they are, uh, yes. They are, uh, they are uh, changed, they, yeah, you, you, actually we would, they would muster us to the, on the flying days and we'd go to briefing and that's when we would learn where we were going. And we would learn uh, what uh, they would tell us the hazards. Uh, that this is a really a heavy uh, uh, an aircraft city, uh, like two that I remember going to was uh, Hamburg and uh, Berlin, and uh, they were well well fortified. And uh, you, you know, it was, a, it, 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 it was it was a target you didn't want to go to many. And, and they were scattered all over, all over Germany. Our, our, uh, other than we went to, we went to Scandinavia one time. We went to, uh, we went on a mission to Norway one time. It was the longest uh, mission that we had, and, and uh, we got to the, we got uh, uh, to the target, and the weather was so bad that we got to almost. The weather was so, so bad that uh, that we had to abort the mission and had to turn around to come back. And uh, it was so long that we had to uh, we had to get rid of our bombs because we had to uh, uh, we had to, to uh, lessen the weight in our plane uh, in, in order to have enough fuel to get back. And so we had to jettison our bombs as soon as we could. And, and uh, you asked about one of the things that I remember vividly. Uh, I remember very well this mission. Uh, there was just lots of planes. The sky was full of planes. And uh, well, a lot of them flying at different altitudes. And we were at an altitude of, of under uh, a lot of the other squadrons. And when they, they jettisoned our, their bomb, we were under them. And the bombs come rain, came raining down. And uh, it was a it was a scary few minutes. Uh, you know, we could 
could see them. We could see them. They were just you know, raining everywhere. And uh, it was a scary time. How, uh, how often did you personally engage as turret gunner? Every mission or a couple of times a mission? And with how many times did you actually have to do a, your job on a mission? Oh, how, uh, what, what was that like? Uh, you actually shoot the guns? Right. We had two that times, is. two times. Actually, uh, actually, I told you the, the time that we uh, <coughs> encountered fighters, the only time we encountered fighters, we would see them off at the distance. That's the only time that we were attacked by fighters. It was the one time, and the second time, uh, we did a low-level mission one time, and we were to, we were to, uh, to uh, fire on the, a railroad yard, and we were flying down, I don't know how many, feet we were, but we were very close down on the deck, and uh, we were strafing, and uh, that was the only two times I really fired my gun in combat. Of course, I fired them into a bomb dump, as I told you. <laughs> Do you remember where the railroad yard was? What, what city the railroad yard was? I do not remember. I do not remember what you were. And did you already tell us what the years were that you were in England? That no, and let me refer as uh, I messed it up so bad with Lee. Let me let me tell you, sort of. Uh, uh, I don't. Well, just, well, just let me tell you my whole itinerary. I went I went into service in February of '44. I went into basic training, and then in, in uh, May to August. That was from February to May. I went to basic training, and then from May to August, I went to gunnery school in Fort Myers, Florida. And then from August to December, I went to crew training in Riverside, California. And then from December, to, to December until September, I was in the 8th Air Force in, in England. And then I was sent home in September, and then I was separated from the service in uh, December 45. So I went to England in December 44, then, right? I went to, yes, December 44 and came home in September. The, uh, Actually, actually, I was in England for six months. I was only in the see, I was in the service for 22 months. I used to say 22 months, uh, four days and three hours, but uh, that was really off the show. <laughs> but I was in it 22 months. Anyway. <laughs> yeah. um, did you ever doubt any enemy fighters? Did I ever? Did you ever shoot down any enemy fighters? No. The only, the only one I fired at, uh, I thought I shot down, but I didn't shoot him down. Really. He actually just dumped down out of sight. And, uh, no. Was that a German plane? Yes. Yeah, they were very clearly marked. And it was, it was the first time it was just as jets were introduced. And the first one I had ever seen. And, and it was the first one that we ever encountered on, uh, on our missions. I mean, even saw. We, would, we saw some of the other planes. But they didn't attack us, and that was, that was the only, the only uh, one that ever attacked us. Any other? Lewis, let me ask you this: How did they teach you to, in gunnery school? How did you learn to fire the gun and how to hit targets? What was the process? Um, well, they actually, uh, um, actually. The, Part of the beginning of training was they uh, put you in a turret, just like you're going to be in, uh, in the plane, and it's got two guns and they're shotguns, and they fire uh, clay pigeons. They're out there and they fire clay pigeons, and so you in your turret, in other words, you can't shoot your gun like this, you're shooting with controls. So they fire and you swing your turret around and, and try to hit that clay pigeon. Uh, then they put you on trucks. And uh, have a target, and you're on the truck, and you've got to shoot the truck. And uh, I mean, you've got to shoot the target. You're on the truck, and there's a target out there, and you've got to, as that truck is moving, you've got to hit the target. And then, uh, after you've done that a while, of course, they then introduce you to the gun that you're going to fire. We were firing uh, the 50 caliber uh, machine guns, the two of them, twin guns. And uh, then they would, then of course, they introduced us to flying and in the airplane. And uh, we would fly, we would uh, fly uh, 
start to say in the desert, we grew in the desert in California, and, and the gunnery school there's also some who school in the swamps down in Florida, and and, and uh, shot at uh, stationary targets, uh, and then uh, they they uh, put us uh, in the in the plane, of course, and then they pulled a target with another plane. It's a big sleeve. And they gave us uh, they gave us tracer bullets that were that were colored, so that we could we could tell what we hit. We could tell who hit it. It was, it was coming out of my gun or from our plane, and it was, our color was blue that day. Then what was in the sleeve was blue. And of course, it was pulled through a lot of a lot of planes shot at. It. And uh, so that was that was pretty well the training uh, when we graduated from there. They much we're going to know. When you went over on the, when you went into the service, were you scared at the thought of going into the, into the war? Not. When you went into the service, were you scared at the thought of going into the war? No, uh, no, no, uh, no, I, I couldn't wait. Uh, in fact, I, I, I joined in, uh, I joined in uh, uh, April or May uh, uh, of uh, whatever year, and then was called until the next February, and, and man, I was I was really antsy. I wanted I wanted to go get at it. Because at that time, I thought I was going to be piloting in the plane, and so I, I couldn't wait to, to get at it. No, I was not. On the on the troop convoy going over from Boston to England, what, well, was it a convoy? Is that right? Yeah. Were there destroyers escorting you, or were you were, or were the troop ships by themselves? Uh, they were. We know we, there were others, but but I mean we weren't in close formation. They were with us, but they were out there. Okay, you need to flip that that. Hour. W Were there destroyers accompanying you? Yes. Could you see them? Yes. Out there, there. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Were you, we were. We at that time we were vaguely aware that they were out there, but you know again, I was nineteen. I, man, you know, I was more worried about the crap game of what I was going to do next or what the movie was on. Yeah, if we're going to see, you know. Uh, how many missions did you go on? Eighteen. Eighteen. Uh, did you have fighter escorts on any or any of them? Yes, the fighters would go with you as far as they could. They actually, because of uh, because of their limitation of uh, fuel, they could only go so far, and they did. And then, and then they they meet you coming back. We didn't have nearly as much of that as, as they did early in the war, uh, you know, uh, because the, the, at the, the time I was there, the Luftwaffe was, was, was pretty well done in. Uh, so they didn't, we didn't have near as much of that as they did before. We didn't need to near as much as they did before. Do you recall what kind of fighters they had with you that, that, that would escort you? That we had? Yeah. You know, I don't, and that's, that's, that's kind of dumb that I don't, but, but I really don't, I don't remember. Did the fighters come out of your air base, or was it all bombers at your air base? All, all, all bombers, all right. My whole wing was all bombers. And when you went on missions, was it all the same type of bomber, all B-24s, or were there different types? All B-24s. No, they, they were, they were, there were others that would be on the same mission that, that uh, were in seven, B-17s. But, but we, we were totally separate. How long would it take you usually to get to Germany on these flights? How long would the flight would it? You know, as, as, as I recall, uh, as, as I recall, probably three, three and a half hours. Now you had talked about the the, uh, the flak. Yeah. What did? How close did you get to flak with your with the plane? How how? Oh, it, was all, it was all around the planes. I mean, it was, it, the, the way you, you can see it is when it, when the when the shell bursts, then there's a there's just a black puff. <coughs> and as you look around, I mean, it's just just black puffs all around. And then if it was if it was closed, a lot of times the shrapnel would hit the plane. You just hear it like rain on a tin roof, and then you see the holes when you go by. The holes in the plane. Yeah, in the skin of the. Plane. Yeah. Did you did it ever get so close that there was any feeling of concussion from the from the from right. the flag? Yeah. Um. 
it seems to me, yes, uh, a few times, not not uh, not many times. Yeah. You you talked about that mid-air collision, that on your second mission. Did you did you know those guys in the other plane? Yeah, yeah, I did. Uh, the guy that the uh, guy that was their nose gunner was one of my buddies, and uh, we were we were in the uh, barracks right next to each other. The guys, on the, how big was your crew on the on the Liberator? How many guys? Eight. And what were their? What, how old were they? The oldest was our co-pilot, and uh, I thought he was ancient at the time. He was probably uh, he was probably uh, thirty-five. He was the senior member. Mm -hmm. uh, probably next was the uh, uh, navigator. He was. Probably 30. He was a guy that I told you was a Harvard graduate, and uh, and then, but most of the guys were around. Uh, I was probably the youngest in the crew, and the rest of them were close to my age. Like if, if I was at that time, I was 20. They were up to maybe uh, 25. How old was the captain? That plane? He was just older than I. I was. I was 20. He was 21. Um, how did the how did the officers and the men, and the enlisted men get on? What was the how did they deal with each other, or not deal with each other? Oh, no, it was a very very uh, casual relationship. Uh, you know, I mean, there was what it wasn't strictly military stuff. I mean, it was uh, very very casual. Of course, uh, there were times when it was supposed to be formal, and we did. We were we were formal, but. Uh, but uh, all of our dealings, I mean, the guys called me Mandy, and I called the, the, the uh, pilot George, you know, and, uh, and the other, you know, we had nicknames for each other, we called it, you know, it was very, very casual, both the officers and the guys, now the, the, the guys, enlisted men had their quarters and their entertainments and their things, and the, uh, the officers had their officers club, and their deal. So we, we didn't socialize a lot, but we, uh, if there was ever an occasion, uh, we might get together and go to town and go to a bar or something. Did you have much dealing with the Brits when you were, uh, I guess you were out and around in pub and such, you would have had dealings with the men? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you chase any girls? Yes, yes. Catch any? Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, I did. Well, that was, uh, yeah, that was part of the game, and that was part of the great reason to go on leave, and, and, uh, and it was, uh, yeah, and, you know, I don't know how the Brits stood us, but uh, the Brits were very, very nice, and uh, you know, I was invited to you know, home a town or two, and they, uh, you know, feed you and so forth, and they were very good to us. And, uh, how did the male Brits your age uh, greet your arrival? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> if I had I been them, uh, you know, we were smart kids, and you know, we tried to talk like them, and you can imagine what a what a horrible we made of that, you know. Uh, if the, if I looking back, had I been them, I wouldn't have liked us much. You know, we could overcome their. We'd go into their pub in great droves, and, and uh, you know, I imagine they got real tired of. Did you did you find that you had any affection for your airplane, or was it really just a piece of equipment? Just a piece of equipment because we made, we flew different ones so much. We uh, I, I was thinking about it so I could name so I could say tell you uh, the name of the plane that we had the collision in. I can't even tell you. But part of that was probably my age and, and uh, you know the things that would be important to me now weren't very important to me then. I mean I didn't care what. time either in the military or as you were going in to the military among the citizens as you know during the Vietnam War there was a lot of dissension about whether we yeah. should be involved now in Iraq there's a lot of dissension about whether we should be involved was there that type of dissension at the time no never never um, no I, I, we, uh, I don't think the country could have been any more united and I don't think the, the, the populace could have been any 
nicer to the military. I mean, gosh, they just embraced us, man. They loved us. You mentioned that you were getting ready to be trained to be on a B-29 to send over Japan. Uh, do you remember where you were when you heard that the atomic bomb had been dropped? Uh, I do not. Do you, do you remember how you greeted that news? I do not. I do not. I would, I would imagine uh, that, I would, that I would have been ecstatic because I didn't want to go to I didn't want to go to Japan. I didn't want to go to the Pacific. Thanks, Lewis, for answering my questions. Pardon? Thanks for asking my, yeah. answering my question. No problem. No problem. Is there anything you'd like to add that we haven't covered in this interview, sir? Um, Well, I'm, I'm glad that there are those that are still interested in knowing uh, about it. Uh, that, uh, you know, that, that, that it, it, uh, it's part of our heritage and uh, that uh, people are still interested in it uh, because we're, uh, you know, uh, I'm told that a, a thousand guys a day are dying uh, that were from that era. Thanks for telling your story and thanks for doing what you did. Listen, I, love, I love telling the story and I love doing the other part of it uh, for a while after I got my britches scared off then I would do the other quite some good. Well, on behalf of the Veterans History Project, the Atlanta History Center, AARP and myself personally, I want to thank you very much for doing this interview with us, sir. It's been 